probably not going to satisfy most of you and you're looking for a slightly better answer than that. So let's move on and um, look at the next step. In order to actually improve the performance of geometry and geography, we need to have a little bit more of a closer look as to how they work and particularly how spatial indexes work. So let's move on to that now. Before we go any further, um, it's probably worth explaining a little bit. I've said spatial queries the term a couple of times and it's probably worth explaining a little bit more what I mean when I say spatial queries. Um, if you look at the line at the top of this slide, select star from T where A intersects B equals 1, basically. That's, that's what I mean when I refer to a spatial query, is a query where in the where condition, or in the where clause, sorry, you've got a condition that's using one of the methods of the geometry or geography data type. Now, in this case, I'm using ST intersects. Um, that's probably one of the most common methods you'll find yourself using. And what ST intersects does is it tests whether A and B, as I've got supplied there, have any points in common at all. So it might be that one of them touches another, it might be one of them is contained within another, or that they partially intersect each other, but they've got some points in common. That's ST intersects. Now, when you normally write a spatial query, um, it's quite common, as in the form I've got here, where A is going to be a column in your table, and B is a parameter supplied to the method that is a fixed search region. So, for instance, if we were looking to find points of interest located in Wales, uh, T might be our table containing countries of the world, A is a geometry or geography column that is containing polygon outlines of each of the shapes, um, and, sorry, uh, A contains points of interest, I meant to say, and the B parameter supplied is a polygon representing Wales. So you select all the rows from the table that intersect that polygon. That's what I mean by a spatial query. Um, and the key thing to note is that it's based on comparing two geometries or two geography instances. You can't compare a geometry with a geography or a geography with a geometry. They must be of the same type. OK, and when you execute that query then, what happens? Well, SQL Server uses what's called a two-stage filter to actually process the, re the results of that query. There's a primary filter and there's a secondary filter. The primary filter, um, as you can see there, it's, it's basically like a first guess at the results. It's an estimate. And what it does is it returns a superset of results that could fulfill that condition in the query. So it's guaranteed to contain all of the results where A does intersect B, but it may also contain a couple of false positive results. And then once you've got the results of the primary filter, that's when you, the secondary filter then comes in, takes the results of the primary filter and it weeds out those false positive results so that the answer you get at the end is the accurate answer. And these filters work on slightly different sets of data. The primary filter goes to the spatial index of the table, if one exists. And the secondary filter then compares the actual values themselves. Okay? If you don't have a spatial index on your table and you run that query against it, all of the work must be done by the secondary filter. And as it says there, the secondary filter is accurate, but it's slow. So when you're, perform when you're creating high-performance queries, what you really want to do is get as much of work as possible done at the primary filter stage. Get that guess to be as good as possible, as fast as possible, and not to contain too many false positives. So how do we do that? Well, we need to now look a little bit about how the index is formed, because the index is where the primary filter looks to get that first guess of results. Now, spatial indexes, I'll say now, work very differently from pretty much any other sort of index in SQL Server. So any preconceptions you might have about indexes at this point might not apply to spatial indexes. Indexes in SQL Server normally use a B-tree structure, and B-trees work very well when your index can be assigned a logical order. So, for example, if you've got... Uh, decimal data or money data or numeric data of any sort, you can arrange it into numerical order. 
if you've got string data, chars or var chars, you can put them into a, a collating sequence like alphabetical order. And if you've got temporal data, you can put that into chronological order. So far, so good. And then we get these spatial types. We've got geometry and geography. How do we put them into an order so we can put them into an index? Well, the answer, or at least the solution used by SQL Server, is to use a grid system. And it uses, in fact, a multi-level grid system. It's got four levels of grid. And in this slide, we're going to step through how that, how that index is constructed, OK? So suppose we have a table that's got a geometry column. And that column contains data representing countries of the whole world, which is what we've got shown here. When you create an index on that column, what you do is you overlay a grid over the whole extent of data in the table to be indexed. And that's your level one grid. So here we've got a level one grid that's a four by four grid of cells. Okay? Now you can actually configure how many cells there are at each level of the grid. Four by four is the low resolution. You can also do a medium resolution grid, which is eight by eight. And you can do a high resolution, which is 16 by 16. But for this example, I'm just going to use 4x4, four four, partly because it's easier to see on the screen. So we've got a level 1 grid, and that covers the whole area of space that's going to be included in the index. And then within each of those level 1 cells, we then have an entire level 2 index. So if we choose that cell, for instance, and zoom in on it, what we're now looking at is that level 1 cell which has been decomposed in into an entire level 2 grid. And this level 2 grid is also 4x4, four four, although it could be 8x8 eight eight or 16x16. 16 16. You can alter the grid resolutions at each of the four levels independently. And then within each of those level 2 grid cells, we have an entire level 3 grid. And you can probably guess what's coming. Within each of those level 3 cells, we have a level 4 grid. So we have four levels of nested grids, essentially that decompose our entire data that's going to be indexed. Now, if you use the low resolution at each of the four levels, as I've done here, you've got four by four, so you've got 16 cells at each, lev uh, each level, so you end up with 65,000 level four cells potentially going to be in your index. If you choose high, you've got 256 cells at each level, so you then end up with 4.3 billion level four cells. So you can get very, very high resolution indexes with high, but that's not always a good thing, which we'll, we'll come on to later. So we've got a grid, but we haven't yet got an index. How do we go from that grid to an index which we can actually use to, to satisfy queries? Well, what the, what the index does is it, having overlaid those grids, what we want to look at is those cells in the grid that either are totally covered by the geometry, or they're partially covered, so some part of the geometry touches that cell, or they simply touch it at a, at a point adjacent to the geometry. And we can look at cells from any one of those four grid levels and include them in the index, but we don't want to include every cell at every grid level. If we did that, our index would be very large, for one thing, and also we'd be failing to take advantage of, of some of the kind of neat features of this nested grid system. Okay? What we want our index to do is we want it to contain this approximation of our geometry. And we want that approximation to be as good as possible so that our primary filter is efficient. But we also don't want our index to be too large because then it will take too long to query and it will kind of defeat the point of having the index in the first place. So there's three rules which SQL Server applies. And these rules are all intended to basically get the grid cells which will help describe the approximate shape of each of these objects with the maximum amount of accuracy, but requiring the least number of cells to do so. And they're called the covering rule, the deepest cell rule, and the cells per object rule. And if we just have a look at each one in turn. Right, the covering rule to start with. If a grid cell is completely covered by geometry, don't further subdivide that cell. What does that mean? Well, what the diagram here is showing, this is a geometry, and it's, I've overlaid it with all four levels of the grid. So you can see them all at once. Okay? You've got level one, which are the big cells. 
Each of those is divided into level two, three, and four, which are the tiny little ones, okay? And what the covering rule says is if you look at these two large level one cells in the middle of the geometry, looking at level one alone, we know that the whole of those cells has been intersected by the green polygon, okay? Therefore, by implication, every one of the level two cells contained within those level one cells must also be totally covered, and the level three cells beyond that, and the level four cells. So it wouldn't add any more information to our index if we bothered storing those grid cells as well. All we do is we store the level one cell. We sell this is totally covered, and that's all the information we need to know. We then go on to the next rule, which is the deepest cell rule. Now, the deepest cell rule is a little bit like the covering rule in reverse. And what this says is, if a cell has been subdivided, so we've gone down to one of the deeper levels, only store the intersecting cells at the deepest grid level. So for this example, if you have a look at one of the little cells around the edges of the geometry where we have drilled through right to level four, each level four cell can only be contained in one level three cell which in turn is only contained in one level two cell. So if we know that one of those tiny little grid cells there at level four partially intersects the geometry, we know again by implication that the level three cell in which it lies must partially intersect the geometry because the, the part of it that contains that level four cell intersects it. So when we have drilled down to a deep level, don't bother storing the, uh, the level one and the level two cells. That's the second rule. And the third rule is a cells per object rule. If subdividing a cell would exceed the maximum allowed number of cells for each object, do not subdivide the cell. Now, this rule is a little bit like, a, it's kind of like a hard, a hard limit that you can set to prevent your index entries growing too large. Even after having applied the covering rule and the cells per object rule, basic, uh, and the um, deepest cell rule, sorry, um, you can still require a lot of individual cells to fully describe the extent of a geometry, and that would make your index too unwieldy in certain circumstances to be useful. So the cells per object rule basically says once you hit a certain limit, don't bother looking any deeper to try to get more resolution of this index. Let's just call a halt there and we'll settle for the approximation we're currently at. The default um, value for cells per object is 16, and that's been chosen to work quite well in, in most circumstances, but we'll, we'll go on to a practical example about how you might want to change that a bit later. If you set sales project too low, then what will happen is that you're not allowing your index to contain those more granular levels of level three and level four cells, which means that your primary filter of the index is gonna contain more false positives. Okay, that's the theory, and now we're going to uh, we're going to look at how that theory of the grid and the index is actually used in practice now by SQL Server to um, to run.